everybody, and welcome to the Board Game Geek Show for January 25th, 2018. Thank you for watching. I am your host, Scott Alden, also known as Aldi on Board Game Geek, and I'm joined today by my co-hosts, Lincoln Damerst and W. Eric Martin. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey, everybody. We're going to start off with our first segment, What You've Been Playing. Everybody loves to hear what you've been playing. Eric, why don't you lead us off with the games that you've been playing lately? I have quite a list of games that range in variety, mostly because I've started hosting a board game club at my son's school. So I'm trying out numerous titles with them, such as Muse, which is a Dixit-like card game that actually doesn't play like Dixit, even though it seems like it, it would, where you give someone a card and a clue, and you're trying to force them to make a hard clue so their team can't guess the card that's hidden among other cards. Oh, some general thing. Uh, Dino Party from Ankama, where you are throwing dinosaurs onto landscapes and hoping they live. It's very simple, not much to it, but kids love throwing dinosaurs. Uh, Take is a two player game by Alfred de Fuller uh, that I will do a video on in the future. It's a neat little game. Uh, Crosstalk. This is a deduction word based party game that we're going to cover in a separate segment. So I'll say no more on that. And uh, Ascension Valley of the Ancients, which is the latest iteration of the Ascension line, the deck building game that's lasted almost, well, yeah, 10 years now, just about. Uh, this new expansion adds some temples that people fight over with a special new resource that some cards have where you try to get control of the temples and then use this resource again so you get these special bonus powers and get this uber temple. So it's kind of the same and different, which is what Ascension does. So, Lincoln, hey, you want to talk about what you've done? Yeah, I played the new Haba game, Iquazu, which is, Scott jokingly said, was the uh, Avatar board <laughs> Avatar game. Avatar the board game. Yeah. It's really, really great. Uh, I love, you know, you're, you only be, are able to do one thing per turn, and so your goal is to optimize when you do it, because... As soon as somebody fills, it's what you're doing is you're collecting gems and special tiles that give you a, a rule breaky thing uh, that lets you have a second action often. Um, but you either pick up a gem or uh, or place for a gem. You don't pick up a gem. You place for a location or you pick up uh, cards, and that is basically it. And then once a row is a column is filmed uh, filled, uh, it's you determine who the, uh, wins what each row is. And um, right, it's a it's a majority, right? Whoever right. has the most gems. But you can in a row. also influence the majority by placing on future columns, which is very interesting. Um, we also played, and the art's great on that. Nikki really loved it. We also played uh, Doodle Rush, which is great because it's so fast. It's basically a six minute game as long as you understand what's going on. Uh, Aldi at first told us to play the purple side, which is the difficult side, and holy moly, was that, was that side hard. Right, it's that drawing game where you're spending one minute drawing and then one minute guessing, and then you do that three times. And that's the game, six yeah. minutes. We had to play it at BGG Con, and I had misremembered that we played the difficult side, but in re reality, we had played the basic side, thinking it was a little bit hard. But then we looked at the back side, which is the purple difficult cards, and ridic they are ridiculous. Like, if you want a challenging drawing game, like, even if you had all the time in the world... These words are just outrageous. It's I, I kind of want to try the hard version just. Oh to my see, gosh, dude! It's so uh, hard. What would happen? It is so hard. Are they really abstract? Is that why they're difficult? Many abstract concepts on the difficult side. Okay. Yeah, like conservative. <laughs> I mean, what did you play, Scott? I've been playing Gaia Project. I just played it this weekend, and I started playing it at midnight. Oof. And we thought, since we knew the rules to Terra Mystica, this is a, they call it a Terra Mystica game on the cover, uh, that we would basically just jump right in and start playing. But no, we had many rules to cover, and it took about 45 minutes to get through the rules. Now, that's with interruptions and stuff. You probably could do it quicker than us. But it is a fabulous game based on Terra Mystica where you're colonizing planets and terraforming them to your, you know, to, to be habitable by, by your race. Uh, I played the Terran, so obviously I'm I'm able to be um, I'm able to terraform on Earth, but to get the other planets right, you spend resources. They also have a concept called Gaia forming, where you're creating new planets that are habitable by anybody um, for a resource. But it's um, it's kind of an interesting thing because it, it kind of basically creates new land for you to settle on or planets. Um, it's the same 
basic overview as Termisca, where you're building buildings to get power, and those power the power of those buildings become a federation, which give you more abilities and resources. And there's a tech tree that's been changed, and I'm not an expert in Termisca, so I don't know all the details of the changes. Check probably BGG for that. Um, but if you are into Terra Mystica and a pretty medium to heavy Euro, probably heavy medium, more on the heavy, less on the medium, then check out Gaia Project, uh, being published by Z-Man Games and Feuerland was the original publisher in Germany. Speaking of Z-Man Games, ICV2 had an interview with executives from Z-Man owner, Asmodee North America, about counterfeiting that was kind of astounding when you look at this. It was Christian Peterson and Steve Horvath being interviewed about the effect of counterfeiting, how large scale it is on the industry, and what can be done about the issue, and how they even discover that counterfeit games are coming about. It's an astounding article where they claim that some games are being copied, are counterfeited up to 70, well, let's see, up to 70 percent of the copies being sold for certain titles are counterfeited. And for other titles, it's you know 30, 40, 50 percent, which is just astounding if you think about the volume that's going on behind the scenes that most people don't see. Right. I, I was dumbfounded when I read the article. By the way, whoever did that interview, kudos. It was excellent. Um, the 70 percent number blew me away. I couldn't I can't fathom that. Um, I don't know what that translates to dollars, but I assume a, a bunch. Um, so I and I think some of the things they've been trying to do, whereas so basically what happens is these piraters sell on Amazon and they can ba basically make an unlimited number of stores. So Asmodee will come in and using Amazon's, um, you know, takedown tactics, whatever methods, whatever that it may be shuts the store down for selling pirated goods, then they just pop up with another one. So it's basically whack-a-mole um, and almost in, impossible to stop um, unless Amazon steps in, which I don't know if that's even possible with all the number of people selling on Amazon um, to go through each one and like look at their stuff. It's like, a, I can't imagine that happening. So Steve Horvath had mentioned that a stronger legislature needs to be created to handle the problems of piracy these days. And I'm kind of like, well, what would that be? Like, I can't even, I'm, I'm sure Steve would have a good answer for that, but I don't know what the American government can do about it. No, that seems like an issue too, of even trying to track down these people. You're going to go to China and figure out because most of the counterfeits seem to be coming from China. Uh, Rio Grande Games had posted about counterfeit copies of Dominion being out there and they posted pictures, how you can tell the difference between the two. And of course that game is just cards. For the most part, you make it easy. I saw reports of Bonanza, counterfeit Bonanza, which you're like, why is someone copying, a, you know, counterfeiting a twenty dollar game? But of course, you'll make it for a dollar and then sell it for ten dollars or whatever through Amazon, and you're still making a bunch of money that way. Well, the interesting thing was the actual plastic stuff that they were they were using. Like he mentioned, a Ticket to Ride, uh, that the trains they were using the the in-game trains as the starting point for the uh, molds and that they would be 10 to 15 percent even smaller than the original trains and that they would even go to that effort because that tooling something like that seems expensive but maybe they're cruddy i don't know <laughs> yeah the ticket to ride trains have a lot of detail in them right with the little windows and stuff and if these are i think i'm remiss i don't know if i'm misremembering what they look like but they just look like little blobs of like rectangle rectangular on, on the uh, the on the counterfeit ones yeah, and the counterfeit ones, right? I've never seen pictures of them. So I've seen some pictures of the of the trains, and they're basically like kind of very basic shapes, whereas the original Ticket to Ride trains are very detailed with, you know, like the windows of the trains and stuff. And I think what's happening is they're scanning the originals and making proofs based on that, making products based on that, because there's a little bit of like fuzzy focus on the art. Like it's not sharp. It's, you know, a little more like muted and like distorted and stuff. So... If you're buying a game on Amazon and it's cheap, you might be getting a pirated copy. If it's if, if it's too cheap to believe, then it's probably pirate copies. That's been the case too, to wrap around the Z-Man as well as another example of this. Someone posted pictures of Pandemic Legacy season one, where they went into massive detail on all the differences between this counterfeit copy and an actual copy where the stickers were cut more all the way through, so it's hard to peel them off, and the 
the white buildings were rounded instead of sharp and the cubes were sharp instead of rounded and just every little detail you go through here. But of course, once you've bought that massively discounted game, there's not much you can do about it. You, know, you can't. I'm actually really surprised Pandemic Legacy was pirated because that Me too. seems to be a hard game to construct. But I guess if there's, I mean, I don't, I'm not offhand remembering the price of Pandemic Legacy, but 80, I think I it think. was over 50. Oh, 80. Yeah. Is MSRP. That's MSRP. Around MSRP and $80, $90. Um, so base, that's a lot of money to be grabbed out of the industry, knock that down by 70%. Someone's making money. That's right. Not the publisher. And not the designers or the publishers or, and like, where it's not going back into the industry at all. Yeah. I got off the phone uh, the other day with someone where they were talking about how they're trying to chase down counterfeiters. This is for an article I'm trying to work on, but we'll see because developments keep happening where now it seems like there's multiple companies. They're finding evidence of not just their games, but someone else's games. So they're trying to get together to coordinate with these different publishers and see if they can collectively approach Amazon with some sort of solution, which I'm not sure how you would do that, except some sort of inventory tracking that locks down who has what. I mean... I don't know. Amazon probably isn't too public with how they handle their inventory. And yeah, I mean, when, once you start giving out information like that, then you can be subverted. Yeah. yeah. So moving on to uh, an exciting release I am really super stoked to hear about is Reiner Knizzi has a new game. Eric, why don't you tell us about this new version, a yes. successor to one of my favorite games, my favorite game. Tigers and Euphrates. Yeah, me too. One of my favorites. Yes. Australian publisher Grail Games, which has, in the past couple of years, had new editions of Medici and Circus Flocati and Stephenson's Rocket all uh, out or coming out soon, now has signed Yellow and Yangtze, a sister game to Tigris and Euphrates. At least that's how Reiner Knizia is describing it, where the gist of the game sounds very familiar to Tigris and Euphrates, where players are building up civilizations, placing tiles onto a board, and you have conflicts as people place leaders of the same type into the board, or they build out states that now combined, and now you have conflicting leaders in there. Now, it all sounds like Tigris and Euphrates, but then there's all sorts of differences with five colors of tiles, and it's a hexagonal board with hexagonal tiles, and a single color pagodas instead of double colored monuments and different ways to resolve conflicts and a market that you can take tiles from instead of solely drawing from the bag and all, all these little differences that you can imagine Kenitia iterating on something that's 20 years old and coming up with different things. I'm really surprised to hear that it's coming. I mean, I thought that was kind of done and done uh, with the card game and, and everything. So. Good to hear it's coming back. Kenitia keeps reiterating what he's done before. It's not just one and done because when Medici came out, it had two player rules, which were new for that Grail Games edition. And Stephenson's Rocket is going to have new maps and not just the map of the English countryside, but I believe there's one in China or Eastern US. There's different ones that, that they had talked about. So whether Kenitia was just thinking long term or he was bored, which does not seem like him, it seems more thinking long term. And you're going to say there's going to be an edition now and I'm going to probably have another edition 10 years from now. And so I had something come to mind. I'll have it ready to go. And now we can sell this game again. Is that releasing at Essen? No, Girl Games will have a booth at Gen Con first year that it will have one. And I believe it's pre-ordering taking pre-orders for Yellow and Young to for debut there and a retail release in September 2018. I'm, I'm excited about the hexagons and how that's going to play into the adjacency on the game. Yeah, it seemed really interesting because, of course, now you're judging connections differently. Also, how pagodas are constructed, it's a triangle of, of tiles instead of a square of tiles. And there's a special power with the leaders where you can remove tiles if you're if you're discarding blue tiles you can remove a tile from the board which can destroy pagodas and other connections and other sorts of things so just all these little iterations here which make it new but not new well i'm going to continue to mispronounce tigris and stevenson's even though you're telling me i guess it's different <laughs> i know and yangtze right i mean i guess it's not yeah. yangtze, <laughs> yangtze, yangtze. yangtze but i maybe i'm i could be totally wrong i'm probably wrong i'm almost certain eric's right and i'm not <laughs> it might be an affectation just because 
I, I do a lot of interviews with people and I try to pronounce their names the way that they would normally pronounce it, even though I wouldn't normally speak that way. So it's, it's kind of the, the radio announcer effect when people know Spanish and then they pronounce something in Spanish and they're like, Maria Rodriguez. And I can't do that, but I can sort of fake it as I'm speaking to the person because it seems polite. So I don't know. That was a, that was a real tangent I'm throwing out there. Moving on possibly to other game news, uh, Pegasus Spiele had, has announced that they are going to release four new games set in the world of Talisman. So Talisman is celebrating its 35th anniversary in 2018, and these four games are all standalone games. They're going to start with a children's game in the second half of 2018 by the designers of The Dwarves, and they will have a card game, a role-playing game, and I forget the other, a dice game? Scott knows. I know Scott's been following this. Right, isn't they doing a kid's game, a, car, a, a trading card game? Or the other two? I don't, now I'm drawing a blank. I believe it was a dice game and role playing game. Well, Pegasus are they making the? Are they doing they another roll. version of the Talisman board game, or is that not? No, be, Games Workshop a, has taken back the rights to Talisman from Fantasy Flight Games, and they have reissued or reprinted the revised fourth edition, and that's now available again from Games Workshop itself, with the expansions coming as well. So the original okay. game is back with the parent company that had it in the first place, and these are new games set in that world. Talisman was one of those games that was very formative in my gaming years. To hear it's been it's thirty five years old now makes me kind of feel old. Um, but uh, I'm I'm a big fan of Talisman. I I feel like it kind of created the adventure board game genre. So I am excited to see new and different twists on Talisman instead of just the board game. But I still am a big fan of the board game. Um, it's an epic, some people kind of think a little simple, but I feel that the flavor and experience you get out of it overrides the simplicity of the game. So Eric, I heard about Plan B games with their new Next Move games, and I only recently heard after that was that they, the games would all be with four letter words. Is this true? Yes, this is an unusual hook for a company, but maybe th there's more to it than that. So Plan B games has started an imprint with the announcement of a game called Reef, coming from Emerson Matsuuchi, uh, designer of Century Spice Road, which is published by Plan to Be Games. And Reef is going to be a themed abstract game, similar to Azul, which Plan B released at the end of 2017. And now Azul is going to move to the next move line, and it's kind of a model of what they want to do, lightly themed abstracts with beautiful components, with four letter names. Uh, th that was the, the restrictions. Those are the walls. If you want to submit the next move, those are the walls you need to meet. With four-letter titles, they can only have 456,979 different games. I think they might be limiting themselves there. Well, what are they going to do about hate? Are they just going to buy that game? Hate, yes. So that brings up a Kickstarter news segment. Um, hate has recently been launched and probably by this point in time funded. We're recording in the future, obviously. But it has um, created some controversy in the board game world. <laughs> uh, we, um, when it went live, there's a video trailer about the board game, and it is quite provocative, is I guess one way to put it. It's uh, a mature rated game. It's definitely for adults. It's mature. It has adult themes and ultraviolence and... Um, yeah, and the artist is uh, Lincoln, I believe you know, from Games Workshop. Adrian Smith, yeah. Great artist. Did the Space Hulk cover. He's been doing stuff for decades, I believe. Right, and this is based on a graphic novel I've not heard of. I hadn't read it before until Simon had come out with this game. But it is, um, it's, it's stirred up controversy in the Board Game Geek world, and if you are interested in following any of that, check out The Hate Board Game Geek page. You can definitely find a lot of comments about the video because it almost seems like a parody of things. It almost it seems like an episode of Honest Movie Trailers where it has this very deep voice and you can feel everything tearing apart and everyone's trying to kill each other. That and a bit of Don LaFontaine. Oh, <laughs> it's so over the top and yet it seems like it's also played straight. This is what people want. 
to to have this style of game. It's definitely something that's not going to retail. This is Kickstarter exclusive because of the content of the game. Uh, so possibly you can get it at conventions if Simon prints lots of extra copies and has it available there. But right now it's being advertised as exclusive to Kickstarter. And no online sales through them? That is what they've said is exclusive, possibly at conventions. This sounds like a purely Kickstarter game, maybe at conventions, but I wouldn't count on it. If you want the copy, if you want the game now, I would I would buy it now. That's my experience with, with Kickstarter. The minis are spectacular on that. I'm really excited about it. They really look great. I just don't know that I want to spend $120 plus shipping, which I guess is determined after the fact. So you don't even know what it's going to really cost overall uh, for the whole this Kickstarter. This is following Simon's pretty standard formula for Kickstarters where you buy in around $100 or, and then you add on up to probably about $500 worth of add-ons. Never to be seen again, right? So these are kind of a, they're going to be a rarity scarcity. Um, Perfect for flipping. Yeah. So if you're into game flipping, then um, you could probably double your money. Don't, don't uh, quote me on that though. <laughs> That's right. Don't hold you to it. Don't hold me to it. We provide no investment advice on this program. No financial no. advice. Yes. <laughs> Purely yes. for entertainment purposes only. Yes. So our final news item today is that Target is now taking board game pitches to publish, I assume, for exclusivity to be in Target stores. Eric, what do you think? It's not exactly clear what is going on, but Target has posted information where they're interested in meeting designers. They mentioned games in particular, but there's other topics as well where they want to meet people at New York Toy Fair and they are scheduling appointments. What are they doing with these appointments? It's entirely not clear. I wrote to a game buyer I know at Target to ask for any information he's willing to provide. And it's interesting because for two years now, Target has released exclusive games at its stores uh, in late July, early August, as they have their switch over from one season of games to the next year's worth of games. They've had exclusive titles, which they have contracted from publishers. They had a Machi Koro version. They had a ticket to ride for kids, which they had wanted. And Days of Wonder made so that Target could have this exclusive item. So they're already reaching out to publishers and getting exclusives. Now they're talking with designers directly. And maybe this is in response to Walmart now having exclusive games as well that are available through its website. And so Target wants to just go one step further, do something. It'll be interesting to see what comes. Right. The Fog of Love has been announced for exclusivity on Walmart.com. And I believe another minis game, Splatter. Splatter Shoot, which is played with household components. Which is a very cool game. When we saw it, Lincoln and I saw it a couple of years ago, it was like, we were like, wow, that's really neat. You should check out. If you're into minis gaming without the min if you have like a ton of minis and you want to play a minis game, check out Splatter Shoot. You just play with anything. Yeah, you play with any any mini. You can play with my remote control. Your own ter <laughs> your cups and saucers as terrain. Did you say you play with sausages? as terrain cups and saucers oh I, i'm curious about your table there you just have sausages lying around on it all the time <laughs> don't know what that means <laughs> okay moving on into board game geek news the biggest news of the day as board game geek has turned 18 years old it's um now legal to vote so uh, <laughs> i just wanted to say thank you to all the users and everybody who has made board game geek into what it is today it's when it got started to in 2000, um, I couldn't believe, I can't believe how far it's come. Um, I never had intended it to be like this. Uh, we just wanted to create a place where we could talk about games and, um, and track all the games. So I'm glad that people have found it useful and interesting and supported us. Um, pretty astounding and staggering and humbling. So thank you very much. And the growth seems only to be escalating. If you want to look at the number of games being added to the database, the number of images that are going on every year, you look at those numbers and it's just, it is huge from year to year what, what's been going on. Right. We just crossed our 5 million visitor, unique visitors mark. Um, and as of this recording, we're on well on our way to 6 million, which is kind of mind blowing as well. And the servers are feeling the pain a bit. So um, we have to, some work to do to fix that. Anything else new to talk about BGG? Any changes beyond just getting older? We have just launched a new feature um, with our image pages that's in beta right now. So go check out the front page of BGG if you want to be included in the in the new beta. 
we are uh, taking feedback and making adjustments and um, reacting to people's comments. So thank you very much for contributing to that. BGG new image pages right on the front page. You can sign up and get get it right on your account right away. So we we changed the design of the game pages, you know, in the not too distant past. And now with the image pages, this is going into the same sort of formatting. What's the overall reason behind the changes or, or sort of what's the the end state here as we move forward? Right. So we launched the new game pages a couple of years ago um, and they've been they've been working. And so we are transitioning the site to that design so that it can work on a phone. Um, and it's a responsive website. You can use it on your iPad, phone, computer, all three simultaneously, like no need for a separate app. So we brought the game pages with some features into the future uh, or into the modern day where you can put click an arrow and go through sort of an image gallery style thing. You can zoom in on the in images and see you know a bigger version. Um, also, we're revamping the comment system. And it's mostly just a a integration with the current design and we're iterating towards that by le releasing feature by feature instead of doing it all at once, which can be, we tried that once and it didn't work. So we're basically trying to iterate on smaller pieces. And eventually once all those smaller pieces are done, the whole site will be converted. And then we could do it again when we're done with that. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll just keep, we'll keep going over and over it. <laughs> oh. I mean, that's kind of the the nature of just the game release anyway. I think of the game industry and all the, all the shows we're going to. So BGG is going to be at the Gamma Trade Show once again in March 2018, and we will be broadcasting, we'll be live streaming from the event with interviews with designers and publishers showing off their new games that will be coming later in 2018. And we've done this for two years now. I'm not sure of the dates at the moment, when we'll be broadcasting or which hours, because we're still waiting for those details. But it's funny, that's like the yearly thing where we know each year now we're going to this, we're going to live stream from Origins and Gen Con and Spiel, the database updating. And now, is like and can, don't forget about Can coming up. Much longer cycle. Yes, uh, we will be at the Festival International des Jeux in Can. This is just adding a lot of trips. And in Nuremberg. Here. A lot of. Uh, <laughs> it's and, a busy, it's yeah. going to be a busy year. I hope you guys are ready for all those, all these uh, new games. I, I'm hard, I'm still working on Essen. I had, there's, I'm not ready yet. We've got to push things back, but you know, life goes forward. Yes, undoubtedly, because publishers have already been announcing what they're doing in 2018 with tons of the German publishers already having their lineups for the trade fair in Nuremberg at the beginning of February with Pegasus and Cosmos and all sorts of others. I'm still waiting. Queen says they're going to get me theirs. And Abacus has one title they've announced and just on and on and on and on. And then the French publishers are right behind that for a month later with Khan. And then the US ones are going to hit in March and just they keep coming. So one final bit about uh, BGG stuff when before we wrap it up here, Lincoln, what's coming up on game night? Well, we just released the other day Majesty for the Realm. Uh, which is a new game from Mark Andre that came out at Essen. It's really actually quite great. I noticed one of the comments, uh, someone said it was like watching craps with all the uh, chip exchange going on. Um, so we need like some pit people to run that for us. Um, and then next week, I believe it's going to be Pioneers from Queen Games. Yes, Pioneers. Definitely a sleeper hit from Essen for me. So I hope a lot of other people get to check that out and get interested in the game. I really love it. It'd be good to see more about Pioneers. I played a couple times because Scott was raving about it at BGG Con. He was just like, this is kind of under the radar, which seems like a lot of things. Lincoln mentioned Iguazu before, which I loved, and no one talks about it. There's just so many games out there, and now it's hard for something to break through. But ideally, you'll show off Pioneers, and people will find something that feels like old school Euro kind of in a modern day. So thank you everybody for watching. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Lincoln, for hosting today. And we'll, we've will we been really appreciating the feedback and the comments that you guys have given us. We um, I even took some of it into consideration. I changed my background. <laughs> so no longer from the Death Star, huh? Right. So that wraps up the Board Game Geek Show. Thank you everybody for watching. See you next time. Bye. Bye.